Hi, and welcome to Bible Study Today. We are so glad to have you joining us for this second installment of our Spiritual Disciplines Bible Study. So that last week we had the opportunity to start talking a little bit about, you know, not only what do we mean when we talk about a spiritual discipline. You know, so many of us have negative reactions and thoughts when it comes to that word. We think of punishment or consequence. But when we think about this term of discipline, it's that whole idea of those practices that put us into the place for God's Spirit to be at work. That they are those very activities in which we discipline ourselves. That simply means that we hold ourselves accountable and keep ourselves you know, on track to be in those places where God has promised to be at work. And so that's where we started last week, as we started thinking a little bit about what are those things that might not make our normal list. <laughs> Is that certainly prayer, Bible reading, you know, other opportunities like worship, devotion, you know, time with friends. You know, that those are things, you know, with friend, time with Christian friends. Is that those are things that we often think about, of those spiritually uplifting and those spiritually building opportunities. But what about some of those other things? Things like Sabbath keeping, things like silence or stillness or even solitude. You know, things that might be really far off of our radar of things like fasting. That what is it that's there that puts us in a position for God to be at work, putting us in memory of all that he has done? And so today is that we want to go ahead and get a little bit deeper into this topic as we think more about where and how do we put ourselves in places and positions so that God may work. And so the first question that I want us to go ahead and start off with today is in this kind of post-Easter weeks and in this season that we find ourselves in, is I invite you to think and reflect with me first on this. Is that what were some of the causes, what were some of the reasons, what were some of the realities at work within the early church to cause such an explosive growth? I mean, think about this. Peter preaches a sermon and 3,000 were baptized. I know that I'm never going to preach that sermon, probably. <laughs> I wish that I did. <laughs> But the fact is, is that we have these amazing things that the Lord was adding to their number day by day in the early church. So what caused this kind of great explosive growth and reaction? So I invite you to think about that personally or with somebody. You can pause this if you want and go ahead and think, reflect, discuss a little bit more of what caused such explosive growth. So, what do you think? So I've heard many different reasons and explanations. Some point to that fact of the very eyewitnesses of the resurrection. Those who saw it all happen were now passionately proclaiming exactly what they had seen. Or some point out to the very fact of, look at what they were doing. Not only were they preaching and speaking, and these were the very eyewitnesses, but look at the response of so many is that they were selling houses and fields, that they were selling the things that they had, and now doing what? Bringing the very proceeds to help and to benefit those in need, those in desperate you know, desire, those who find themselves poor or sick or injured, lame or blind, or all sorts of other situations. The church was truly responding with great joy is that we talk about the fact that again and again in the book of Acts is that you hear things of this sort, is that then the Spirit moved, and then the Spirit, and then the Spirit, that certainly the Spirit was absolutely at work within them. But I also have to ask the question, well, then how or why was the Spirit so at work? I think it's partially because they were also putting themselves in the places where the Spirit promises to be at work. Is that how does the end of Acts 2 describe it? Is that they gathered regularly, devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, 
is that they gathered in the temple daily. And then after worshiping and learning and teaching in the temple is that then they returned to their homes, breaking bread and spending time in fellowship and encouragement with one another. Is that they were giving to the poor. They were placing themselves in positions for God's spirit to be at work. It wasn't just simply that they were kind of sitting around with nothing to do and now the Spirit prompted them. But indeed, they were placing in their lives the very word, the very preaching, the very people, (laughs) the very gifts, not just of food and conversation, but the very gifts like Lord's Supper and baptism. And you saw the very passion that these who have come to know now proclaim. But that leads us to what I want to start us off with today, is a reflection on Acts chapter 4. That Peter and John had been now walking into the temple in the beginning of Acts 3. They saw a lame man who was being carried in, being set at the very gate up into the temple. For each and every day, this lame man was carried and placed there as he was seeking money and goods to be able to sustain his life. And so Peter comes and approaches this lame man, and the first thing Peter says is, I don't have silver or gold. I'm pretty sure that man was thinking, then why are you bothering me? But Peter says, I do not have silver or gold, but I have the very gift of Christ. And so in the name of Jesus be healed. And now, all of a sudden, as this man, who wasn't even seeking this gift, now finds himself receiving this gift of grace and this blessing poured out, is that crowds begin to gather who had seen him day after day doing this very thing of begging. Now he finds, you know, they find him jumping and, and walking and all of those things as he rejoices. And so now what happens in all of the chaos and all the tumult is that now the very temple authorities take into custody Peter and John. And that's where we pick things up in Acts chapter 4, is that they are now arrested as they are proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And this says this in verse 5, On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. Where else have we heard those names? Where else have we heard those names gathered around the trial for someone who had been recently arrested? Just a few chapters before, just a number of weeks prior, is that those very same high priestly individuals gathered together to now plot and plan not only the arrest, but then that beginning initial trial of Jesus before handing him over to Pilate. So now Peter and John stand before those who brought all of the very death of Jesus to bear. And so how do these disciples react? (laughs) That it says this, that when they had set them in their midst, they inquired, by what means, by what power, or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today for doing a good deed concerning a crippled man, then let it be known to all of you that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this man, this man, by him, this man is now standing before you. And there is salvation in no other name. What happened? (laughs) What happened to the worried and concerned and fearful disciples that fled and ran at Jesus' arrest and trial? 
And now, as they stand there with boldness, what has happened? Well, not just the resurrection, not just Pentecost, not just all of that, but what do we see? The very fact that they continue to be passionately about those very things, the very gifts that God has given to them. But so now, this is where we get to our interesting part. Verse 13 of Acts 4. And it makes me ask this question of what characteristic was the disciples uh, known for by friend and foe alike? What characteristic was so key, so important, that it was noted, <laughs> noted and noticed by all? That it says this, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. That by their dress... <laughs> By their speech, by the very way they carried themselves, Peter and John displayed exactly what their background was. They hadn't attended the right schools. <laughs> they hadn't attended the right social groups. They hadn't gr been grow raised and grew up among the very social elite. And yet, who are these to now so boldly and courageously speak this to us? <laughs> is that this is what Luke notes, that they perceived that they were uneducated common men and they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. That what characteristic was noticed by all? What characteristic should be noticed by many in our day? those who have been with Jesus. <laughs> that certainly Peter and John, like none others, had been with Jesus. That they walked, they talked, they lived with Jesus all along his route of ministry. But the question that I want to ask today is that others, when they look at our lives, when they look at how we carry ourselves, how we speak you know, to others, how we care for others, how we organize and what we give to and what we don't, is that do they see and do they recognize that we have been with Jesus? That certainly many have been to worship. Many have come to church. But would we be those that have been recognized as those who have been with Jesus. See, that's the very challenge that is put before us, is that how do we find that very gift that we indeed embrace what God has given to us, allowing him to have his way within our lives. See, that's what the spiritual disciplines are about, that his will would be done and not my own. And so I want to walk through with you a little bit of a resource that I have, you know, in my pastoral library. Is that it's a book by, the, by Henry Nouwen named In the Name of Jesus. I said why I want to walk you through this resource is I think that it presents not only the calling of our spiritual discipleship, but the challenges and the temptations of our spiritual discipleship. And it offers to us some reflective things for us to put before our consideration. And so that's where we're going to go ahead and get into uh, now, is that we're going to look at two different sections of the Bible. Is that we're going to be looking at John chapter 21, verses 15 to 19, and Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. That in John 21, is that Peter... Peter, who had now denied Jesus, Peter, who had been, you know, braggadocious and boastful, now finds himself face to face with Jesus after he has been raised from the dead. Is that in this particular time is that Christ is again recommissioning Peter for his life of service, for his life of discipleship. And so Matthew 4, in contrast, is the temptation of Jesus in the desert. 
is then what kind of challenges and temptations are thrown at Jesus within his ministry? And then as we think about that ministry and Peter's discipleship and ministry, is then what interesting contrasts do we begin to see? That's what Henry Nouwen was looking at. See, if you don't know the name Henry Nouwen, is that he was a, a Harvard professor for many years, 25 years uh, plus, I think that it was, is that after 25 years of teaching at Harvard, writing many different books and doing many different amazing things, earning many different degrees, is that Henry Nouwen found himself leaving it all of the Ivy League to go and to work in a, uh, in a community of those who found themselves dealing with with severe mental disabilities and you know, severe mental issues. And so he uh, moved into that very community and continued to minister and care for them. And so the book, In the Name of Jesus, is a reflection about Christian leadership and growth in light of his personal experience of growth. And so that's where we want to go ahead and get started as we turn to John chapter 21, verse 15, as we begin to look at what is here. So Jesus has now just appeared to the disciples who were fishing on the Sea of Galilee. Is that uh, there they found themselves now not, you know, not having caught any fish all night. Is that Jesus, this unknown stranger on the seashore, offers the unwanted encouragement. Why don't you try the other side of the boat? <laughs> and sure enough, they now find their nets filled to the brim. It's that Peter immediately knows that this one off there on the seashore is Jesus. And so he immediately dives into the water and swims to shore. The other disciples say, don't worry, Peter, we'll bring in the boat. <laughs> So now, all of a sudden, Peter and the other disciples find themselves on the seashore with Jesus. After having a breakfast together, is that what comes next? Is that now Jesus, whether he took Peter aside or more likely the way that it seems, that maybe that Jesus had this conversation with everyone watching, is that Jesus now begins to ask this. He says, Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. And then a second time, and then a third time, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? And so the question I want you to reflect upon or to discuss with someone else is then why is Jesus so insistent on asking this question? Peter, do you love me? Is there, what is it that's behind this very question that Jesus now asks three times to Peter? So maybe you've had the chance to now spend a little time looking at the scriptures and, and thinking about this question. Is that some might point out, well, it seems like, you know, it's that, that Jewish mindset of the more you repeat something, the greater emphasis you have. Most certainly it is that. Is that some point out, is that just as Peter had denied Jesus three times on that fateful night, now Jesus three times ask Peter, do you love me? Is that some people may point out the fact that in the first two questions that Jesus asked Peter, is that do you agape me, or you know, agapao technically, <laughs> is that you know, do you love me with this undying love? Is, is this is kind of like self-giving love? And Peter responds, you know, Lord, you know that I phileo you, which is a, a word of love, but it's more of that kind of friendship, fellowship, you know, a more human-based love. Is that we think of Philadelphia, you know, uh, is that the city of brotherly love. You know, that's, you know that that's where that word comes from. And so some might point out is that Jesus asks him again and again, 
do you truly love me? And Peter says, you know that I love you, Jesus. And it says when the third time Jesus meets Peter where he's at, and he asks, do you phileo me, is that now Peter is hurt. Well, it's not only that he probably recognized the threefold denial and the threefold questioning, but he also realized maybe that change in tone. But I want us to push a little bit deeper. That why did Jesus ask this question and not many others? That Jesus didn't ask, Peter, are you sorry? <laughs> Jesus did not ask, Peter, do you regret what you've done? Is that, Peter, do you feel guilty? No, Jesus doesn't dwell upon that, and I don't think that he is there to try to make Peter feel guilty. He's asking a little bit of a different question. Some might point out, is that, Peter, do you love me more than these? <laughs> That's how he, Jesus asked the first question. What about these other disciples? Do you love me more? See, Peter had sworn and pounded his fist on the table that I don't care if all of these others leave you, I will not. But that is exactly what Peter did. And so we find ourselves in the midst of this asking that question, why? And so as we begin to look into that, is that I want us to go ahead and we're going to hold our finger in John 21, and we're going to flip over to Matthew 4. As we think about that temptation of, of Jesus, is that what's the first temptation that is offered there? And what do we see there at work? Is that the tempter came to Jesus when he was hungry, and he came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, then take these stones and command them to become bread. So what's that first temptation of Jesus? When I think about it, I think about that fact that Jesus has all of this power, has all of this authority, Jesus has all of this there. So how is he going to use it? <laughs> how is he going to put it into good use for others. See, Henry Nouwen, as he points out the first temptation, he uses the very word of relevancy. <laughs> That's really the first temptation is a temptation of relevancy or usefulness. See, in this world is that we are often forced to try to see what use, what benefit, what is it that we really have to offer others in the face of a world that has so much difficulty, has so much need, has so many things that are crying out for us to do something, or especially for God to do something. Will he use that power for what we see as useful and good? And that's exactly where we see that temptation that is there. Are we going to be useful, or do we see ourselves or get our identity from simply being useful to others? See, Jesus comes to Peter and asks the question, not, are you sorry? Not, are you regretful? Jesus doesn't ask, as Henry Nouwen you know, says, is that he does not ask that how many people are taking you seriously? That how much are you going to accomplish for me? Can you show me some results? But instead, Jesus asks, are you in love with me? <laughs> See, we are so often thinking that life is a question of relevancy, a question of usefulness. Am I being productive in all that I do? Don't get me wrong is that Jesus does desire to use us, but first and foremost, where does this fall? It falls first upon life as being, not doing, of gift and grace, not works and deeds. And so what does Jesus come asking this question of, do you love me? Is that he comes asking that primary place of that question of devotion. Is that what do you truly love, Peter? Do you love what I can 
give you? Do you love what I can do through you? Do you, do you love me simply because you think that I can accomplish something or that I'm going to be useful to you? No, Jesus desires not for us to find ourselves in this time of looking at things for an eyeglass of relevancy or usefulness. But as Henry Nouwen says, he says, Jesus is looking that we would be vulnerable, not just before him, but for others. Recognizing that there are so many ways that what we have to offer that will not solve the problems of the world. And so the first thing that he calls us to is that very place of what Henry Nouwen calls contemplative prayer. Is that stillness, silence, solitude, time away simply with Jesus because we love him, not because he is useful to us. That we would be still and silent, recognizing that the world does not turn by our actions that we would be silent, recognizing that too often we fill our lives with words and noise, trying to mask the fact that we sometimes don't have the answer and we don't know what you know, the solution should be. And we are trying to hide the fact that too often that we find ourselves rushing around. So he calls us to contemplative prayer, is that are we those that are going to be recognized as those who have been with Jesus? And so that's that first call of the spiritual discipline of putting ourselves in a place that is not just about folding our hands and bowing our heads, but it's about opening our hands and saying, God, I come to you empty, <laughs> and I pray that you would fill me up. And so we come in stillness, in silence. We come in solitude, not busy and active and trying to show just how useful we can be, but recognizing that there is something deeper at work. That until we deal with what's going on within me, <laughs> that the fact is, is that I'm only prone to begin to hurt and to harm and to cause more problems in the lives of others. And so the first thing he calls us to is contemplative prayer. And so what about as we move on to this? Is that Jesus, once again, in those three different places in John chapter 21, not only does he ask Peter, do you love me? But he now calls him to feed the sheep, to feed the lambs, to feed his sheep. He does it, you know, multiple times. So what's Jesus doing is that Jesus is calling Peter again. The great big redo of life is that Peter is the example not just of second chances, of 900th, 9,000th chances, that Jesus continues to call Peter into service and ministry towards others. But even as he does that, as he places Peter to be a shepherd under the great and good shepherd, to care for the sheep and to care for the lambs, is the fact is, is that Peter is not somehow called out separately from them, but that he is still just as much one of them. And so the fact is, is that Jesus calls Peter into ministry and to service, and he calls us into various ways of how we use our vocation to serve others. But so if we flip back to Matthew chapter 4, and we look at the second temptation. So if the first temptation of changing stones into bread so that that might be useful, is that what's the second temptation? That the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. He takes him there into the middle of everything in the hubbub and the chaos and everything that goes on in the temple. And he indeed shows, if you want to prove yourself, prove it here so that all may see. Prove it through this amazing and spectacular miracle that is there. So what do you say? 
How would you define the second temptation? What is it that is now put before Jesus? Go ahead and discuss, reflect, talk. So what, what do you say? What's this second temptation? Is that Henry Nouwen says is that this is that temptation towards the spectacular. Is that temptation to be spectacular, to be that individual who has your stuff together, to really show off to everyone else that you have your life in control. Do your thing. Stardom. Individual heroism. That the self-made man or woman who can do it all alone. Just show everybody. <laughs> And isn't that how so many approach leadership? See, Peter is now called to be a leader as he goes and cares for others. So is he going to be one who comes with that stardom, that spectacular of now placing himself in a different level? <laughs> See, how many times as we grow within our faith or do we find ourselves in places of leadership that we begin to distance or separate ourselves. But the fact is, is that the question or the invitation that Jesus has is a question of servant leadership, of service and ministry. It's that invitation that you are not only of the people, but you are for the very people, Peter. Then what is it that we see? Is that we are called, as in a quote from Henry Now that we are called not as professionals who know their clients' problems, but we are called as vulnerable brothers and sisters in Christ who know and are known, who care and are cared for, who forgive and are being forgiven, who love and are being loved. The fact is, is that what we see is that fact, the second spiritual discipline we want to talk about is that fact of living and abiding among one another, that there are no distinctions among us, but that all are called to live in the love and the forgiveness and the grace, that there is not a hierarchy, but there is simply that very community. And we dare not set ourselves apart or aside over the others. And so what is it that we see? We're called to confession and absolution. Not just what we do in service, or not just what the pastor sometimes does in private, but within our individual lives with one another. That are we willing to be vulnerable to ask for forgiveness, to speak forgiveness, to be those who live in that community of being bold and confident enough to live lives that are vulnerable before one another. And so that's that second thing. So the first thing, contemplative prayer. The second thing, how are we living in that connection with others and indeed sharing that forgiveness with others? And so the third aspect here is that what is it that we see at the end of John chapter 21? So here's Jesus speaking to Peter. He asks his questions. He give, gives his calls. Is that here is Peter being instated into this position and this vocation that lies ahead. Uh, lies ahead. And so what is it that we now hear? But Jesus concludes in this way. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, that you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. What does that have to do with anything? Jesus all of a sudden uses this image, this analogy of the aging of a person. When we're young, we do our own thing. We are independent in our own ways. That as we grow older, is that we become dependent upon others. What does that have to do with Peter? Well, the fact is, is that Peter, when young, he will do his own thing. But what is it that Jesus now says? That another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. See, Jesus is speaking 
of Peter's death. He's speaking of the fact that this very call to discipleship, to take up his cross and follow me, will indeed for Peter lead to his cross. Not just a metaphorical or illustrative idea, but a literal thing for Peter. This job will kill you. That's a hard thing in an interview. <laughs> but what is it that Jesus is really getting after? That he's getting after the fact that Peter has to realize that this very calling of being a disciple of Christ is one that is not about us, but is each and every day dying to ourself. And Peter was so sold out on this love for Jesus that he was willing to indeed die for the very cause. And so Jesus comes and he speaks to us this very word as well. As we think about that fact about how do we go about our lives and service to others. Is it, is it about us or about others? Is it about what we can serve and how things will go? Or is it about us having our way? See, if we go back to that very uh, temptation of Jesus in Matthew 4, is that we see that whole idea of a third temptation. In Matthew 4, what, does, what comes before Jesus? But that challenge to then go ahead, that, Jesus, that the devil takes uh, Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, and he offered it all to him at the low, low price of bowing down worship Satan. So what is this temptation? He's offered kingdoms and glory and power and riches and all of those things. So what is that temptation? It's that temptation that are you going to be about power? Jesus, what is your ministry going to be about? Is it going to be about kingdoms and armies? Is it going to be about glory and honor and thrones and power? Is it going to be about you being in control, Jesus? Is that Jesus was willing to lose control so that he might redeem us. He was willing to give up his power so that he might become weak, that he would become a human and become a servant and come to the cross and to die our death that we deserved. See, what's the temptation here? The temptation is between a path of power and a path of love. And so what's the very thing that Peter is called to? Peter is called to discipleship that leads to that very love and care of others, not power for himself or his very will. And so how do we go about our lives? How do we go about making decisions that are not about us and our control and our service, but about others? Is that we are called to the third spiritual discipline of theological reflection. Fancy word. For we look into the scriptures and we look at how Jesus and his disciples and Christians who have gone before us, that how did they live? That whenever the church chooses power over love, we fail. <laughs> and so many times we see in the history of the church that we have failed precisely where it comes to power. But in the scriptures, as we th reflect theologically, as we look out into our world and look into our lives and say that how does this message that Christ came and died and rose for me, that this gift is a free gift of grace and forgiveness and love and acceptance, is that now as we reflect and we think, holding our scripture in one hand and the newspaper in the other, or holding the Bible in one hand and our job description in the other, is that where do we see Christ calling us forward? See, as we wrap things up today, you'll kind of see here that there is this nice, balanced devotion in this. That not only is it calling us to step back, but to also engage. It calls us not only to, to go inside, but then for us to serve others. Is that what do we see? We see what some have described 
as spiritually spiritual symmetry. So I get this line from you know, Tim Mackey, the, you know, one of the Bible Project individuals, is that it talks about this whole idea of the, the symmetry of our Christian life and walk. What do I mean by that? Is that how many of us would like only half of a tire for our car? <laughs> Probably wouldn't get you too far. No, the fact is, is that we need that balance of both sides for our spiritual life. And so if you might imagine that very, you know, spiritual reality, I'll go ahead and draw it here. So if we go ahead and imagine our spiritual life and we begin to divide it into the very different pieces there, is that one practice has a counterpart in another practice of the faith. And so what do we mean? Well, not only are we called to community, but we are also called to solitude. That not only are we called to prayer, but we're also called to action. So not only are we pro, you know, called to be those that are generous with our giving, but also to be those who are humble in our receiving from others. Are we too proud to accept gifts from others? Or when we find ourselves in serving, are we willing to go and serve and all do anything for Jesus, but when it comes to somebody doing nice things for us is that we are too strong-willed, too independent to allow it to happen. And then as we find ourselves not only in times of fasting, but in feasting, in times of resting, and in working. Now we've been talking about this whole idea about how do we find... I apologize. I thought I had silenced my phone. <laughs> That as we, as we conclude today, is that we think about that whole idea about what God has done for us. That he has indeed shaped us in that very way by the very places that he is at work. And so within the spiritual disciplines, we seek to put ourselves in a place that he might work in our lives. That others may see and recognize that we have been with Jesus. And so may God bless you as you continue to be about that very contemplative life, theological reflection, and on that confession and absolution with others. And so if you are looking for a resource to help you with that, is that one thing that I have is I have a daily prayer booklet uh, that I have available uh, that I've you know, used and, and kind of uh, brought together a number of resources that I use for my personal devotion that helps me shape my time and my place with God and in that very response. And so if you'd like one of these, is that go ahead and please contact me at the church office. You can you know, either find you know, my email in the church directory or go ahead and visit our church website. Is that go ahead and email me and I'll be glad to go ahead and uh, share with you that file or print one off for you next time that you're at church. But God's blessings be with you today, and may his peace always abide in your life. Amen.